Henshaw and I'm the seminary track intern at Williamsburg Presbyterian Church. Thank you all for joining us online for this week's Lenten meditation. We'll be continuing with this series online. So again, thank you so much for tuning in. And I'll also mention that Wednesday evening from 7 to 7.30, when we would usually host the service, we'll be instead hosting an online discussion using Zoom. So it'll be a live discussion and we'll have discussion questions, but please also bring your own questions and your own thoughts. And we look forward to seeing you there. So again, that's Wednesday from 7 to 7.30 online. Now, if you will join me in prayer. Gracious God, we come together as a community of faith, concerned and confused. We bring with us our fears and our anxieties and our questions. We are surrounded by reminders that this world is often unfair and that people are suffering. We come to you praying for hope and for community, and we pray that your presence be known. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we will be looking at the book of Amos. So if you have a Bible handy, like I do, uh, you can pull it out and turn to Amos. Uh, be reading from chapter 5, verses 12 through 15. So feel free to read along with me if you would like. Again, that is chapter 5, verses 12 through 15. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, Amos, one of the many prophets in the Bible. This book is one of the smaller ones, uh, sandwiched between Joel and Obadiah, and it contains a collection of sermons and poetry in which Amos is telling the nations of Israel and Judah and many surrounding peoples as well that they're screwing up, um, and God knows it. Uh, he specifically calls out these nations for their treatment of the poor. Really, I should say mistreatment of the poor. He points out that the ancestors of these nations were also once poor and enslaved, just as the people they're mistreating in their own nations of the day. And then, just to add a cherry on top, he tells the people that God has given them so many blessings, and with those blessings comes great responsibility. And with that great responsibility, there is potentially great consequences. Now just let that sink in. At the beginning of Lent, my friend Mackenzie and I decided to do Lent together because neither one of us is very good about giving anything up and remembering not to eat the chocolate for 40 days, so we decided we would do it together. Now, Mackenzie lives in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I live in Williamsburg, obviously. Uh, so we were brainstorming how we could observe Lent together at a distance. The irony is that we came up with this weeks ago, long before social distancing was a part of every person's daily vocabulary. Uh, what we decided to do was to reflect and to meditate on a number of themes. Mainly, what is Lent all about, anyway? And so our first week of meditating and reflecting centered around a tangential question, 
what does it mean to have a relationship with God? And what is my relationship with God? Those are some big questions. And we just talked about it. We didn't reach any conclusions. I don't know if you can reach conclusions there. Um, but it's great to just talk about. And so a little bit of backstory. Mackenzie and I became friends when we both worked for an organization called Cross Missions in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is my hometown. Uh, the thing that brought us together in this organization was the work that we were doing. Day in and day out, we were leading middle school and high school youth groups from across the country, out and about in Charlotte to various ministry sites. And these ministries provide a range of services for people who are experiencing homelessness, people experiencing food insecurity, physical disabilities, a very wide range. So my friendship with Mackenzie, along with many other relationships I built that summer with my coworkers, with the visiting churches, uh, with people at these ministry sites. Those are some of the most precious relationships I have. And if I learned anything from that summer, it's that God's work cannot be done alone. It requires community. It builds relationships just inherently, and it connects us to each other. Now we've all been told to self-quarantine, to avoid other people and avoid public places. So the question on many people's minds is, how do we stay connected? How do we practice social distancing, but at the same time, make sure that we are not emotionally distancing from one another? In the midst of all this fear in the world right now, there are some people who are facing impending hardships that are not necessarily of the virus itself, but are the result of the way it's affecting our society. And these populations will be hit disproportionately than, um, will be hit disproportionately by the economy and these are the populations that are usually hit harder in times of great stress, whether it be a recession or whether it be a natural disaster. These are also the populations that Mackenzie and I were serving and working with through our work with Cross Missions two summers ago. So what about those people who can't work from home? Or what about those people who don't have a home to be quarantined in? What do we say and what do we do? Well, lots of people are asking those same questions. And I've been so inspired in the past several days by the ways that people are coming together. Again, not physically, but coming together nonetheless as community to support those who are facing serious economic stress, those who are concerned about their mental health in this period of quarantine, and of course, those are, who are concerned about COVID itself. I saw one article from BBC earlier today with a new word that's been coined in Canada. The word is caremongering. So caremongering is supposed to be an alternative to scaremongering. And the idea with scaremongering is that uh, people are building up fear, the fear is just increasing, um, and you know, you're perpetuating fear in others by spreading exaggerations or false information. But the Canadians have said, no, we should have caremongering. And so caremongering, the idea is to instead spread positivity and kindness and encourage kindness and positivity in the world right now and in communities. 
this is an opportunity for humanity to do exactly what God calls us to do in the book of Amos, and that is to love one another and to care for one another. And the challenge is figuring out how to do this at a distance. So a lot of these caremongering efforts and groups are being set up through social media outlets, um, working online, and the whole aim is to provide support for at-risk members of the population. Although this term seems to mostly be in Canada, the idea is everywhere. It's across the globe, it's in the United States, on the level of the nation, and just at county levels and school district levels even. I mean, I have been blown away by the number of online educational resources that companies are either discounting or giving for free to students so they can continue their education. Um, the number of people who are setting up food drives for local school kids so that they can get an extra meal for the day that they would otherwise get in schools. Um, people who are going to the grocery stores on behalf of those who are otherwise unable right now. These are the moments that connect us. This is justice work and this is humanity and this is love and this is God. These are also the moments where we find ourselves in relationship with one another. Amos tells us that our relationship with God is deeply intertwined with the way that we treat other people. And that is why it is so important for him to draw attention to these nations and to the way that they're mistreating their poor. In Amos, God is asking for us to do justice and also asking us to do it together. God asks us to engage with each other in making the world a better place for all who live in it. We are called to do good by a God who wants goodness for us. And yes, there's a lot of responsibility that goes along with that. <laughs> And as we find our communities in the upcoming weeks, remember that these relationships are built in love and in compassion, not just for one another, but for a broader global community as well. If you'll pray with me again. Almighty God, we pray for strength and for creativity as we figure out how to help others in this unprecedented time of uncertainty. We know that you are present with us and that your love is with us. Guide us with this love so that we may nurture our communities and our loved ones. Thank you for the hope that you generously give. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for tuning in with us. Know that you are so loved and cared for in this faith community. Um, and again, to reemphasize, we'll be having that live discussion Wednesday evening from 7 to 7.30. So I look forward to seeing some of you there. Thank you.